Welcome to uh, our first ever VBS Sunday, if you will. Um, before I get started on that, I just want to remind you that out, outside, when you leave service, these questions answered um, forums are still out there. We're still looking for uh, some more responses so we can begin to put that series together. That will start in about four weeks. Um, we'll be starting into that here at the end of summer, I know. I hate to say that at the end of summer, but anyway, um, it, it does happen. We are so excited about today. Uh, we're excited to have the kids up here with us. We're excited for this reason. I, I shared this with the praise team before, uh, the worship team before we started this morning, and that is this. Uh, the church, for some reason, and, and I, I've, I've been a part of the church literally my whole life, um, the church for some reason often, usually, <laughs> does a really, really poor job of celebrating its victories. It's like we do something and God is in it and through it and all over it, and then we just kind of move on like, oh, okay, that happened. We'll do it again later. And that's so sad. That breaks my heart that that's how we treat things like that. Um, I don't think that's how God wants us to treat. I think he wants us to celebrate him and the work he's doing, and we got to acknowledge that in order to celebrate. And so that's what we've gathered um, here to do. First thing I want to do this morning, I wanted to say thank you. Um, what is so cool is how many people were involved with the week of VBS. Um, there are over 60 volunteers. That's a tremendous number. Uh, we, we were at a church of, of about 500 before this, and we would have around 100 or a little more than that um, each night at, at VBS. And we had 60 here every night helping with all kinds of different things. So very, very well done. Thanks for those people that were able to pray throughout the week. They couldn't be here because of work or whatever else. Thanks to the parents that brought the kids um, to be here throughout the week. Thanks for the desserts on Thursday night. I'll share more about Thursday night later on. Um, but it was an incredible, incredible theme. The theme, the great treasure hunt. Of course, the usual treasure hunt is all about finding money of some kind, treasure, a worth things, of, things of worth in this world. The great treasure hunt, of course, is about finding something so much greater, uh, a, uh, a treasure that you can never lose, a treasure that can never be taken from you, a treasure that will be stored up for all eternity in heaven. And so that was the theme of our week. This is our first ever VBS Sunday, and we want to do this. We just want to celebrate what God was able to do for you to hear the songs, see the videos. You'll see some more from the kids later on. I'll begin this part by letting you know about the mission that we supported. We were fortunate enough to not just support one of the missions that our church always supports, but actually have those missionaries here physically present with us throughout the week. Uh, there was a little hiccup in that. Uh, Lubins and his wife, um, Elizabeth, uh, were, or Jessica, sorry, were the ones here this week. But uh, Lubins um, had surgery scheduled for a hernia later on in the summer. It got rescheduled for um, Wednesday at like 1 in the afternoon. So they were only able to be here Monday and Tuesday, but that was okay. It was enough to get the kids started. It's a mission called Damu Christian Mission in Haiti. Uh, they've got a clinic that they just opened, a medical clinic they just opened this last year. Um, I think this current calendar year. I uh, have school there um, and, and all kinds of resources, but we got to meet them briefly um, this week. And before they left, um, I asked them, I said, okay, can you give us something specific? Give the kids something specific to raise money for, a goal, if you will, for the week. Um, and they said, and they kind of looked at each other and said, well, there is something we've considered, but it's not been in the budget. How about this? I said, great. They needed a new oven for their uh, mission house there. They, they didn't have an oven or the one they had is barely working. And they said that cost around $600. I said, perfect. So we shared that with the students that night. And then we also shared students. Here's the thing. $600 is our goal, but we also have a matching fund. Our missions committee here, our missions team, I guess in the past has done this. And Tony and Jerry said, yeah, we'll do it again. Uh, we'll double whatever the kids give. I said, that is awesome. That's perfect. So that surely we can make it to $600. That would be great. And so at the end of the week, um, we had $638.67 in donations from the kids and parents. Aha! So I had to go back to Tony and Jerry and say, are you sure? You still want to double? And you were going to say you were going to double. And they said, absolutely. And so if you're familiar with missionaries and the way their budgets and lives work, then to offer them $1,200 out of the blue is an incredible, incredible blessing for them, especially with maybe some potential extra medical expenses and I want to bring up Lubins, her husband, right now, because uh, after said surgery, surgery went well, there was a few difficulties, but it, it went well overall. However, he had a very adverse uh, reaction to the pain meds, so he's on Tylenol, and that's it. So any of you who've ever had sur surgery, maybe even hernia surgery, Tylenol ain't going to cut it, um, and you know that, so please be in prayer for him. Uh, quick recovery. He's not able to drive. That's one of the things they've got to do is go around and visit supporting churches and things, and so, so be, be in prayer 
for them. Uh, numbers throughout the week, the first night was 85 students. We grew slowly throughout the week. So on Friday, we had somewhere between 96 and 98 students. We had some people come in late because they had some athletic things going on and, and stuff like that. But it was a tremendous, tremendous number of students. Here's the great number. Throughout the week, more than 120 different students were here at some point in time. And all I must do is remind you briefly that all it takes is one. One encounter with the good news of Jesus is all it takes to change a person's eternity. So be in prayer for those students, even if they were only able to make it once throughout the week. There were more than 60 adults serving throughout the week. Some came and went. Most were here all week. It was an incredible thing to see them. And all I can say is, well done. Next year, because we're already thinking about next year because that's what God has us doing. We want to get more, even more people involved. And here's how. One of the groups that often gets left out of this are an older group of people. We want to find, create, invent, if we have to, some new ways for those folks to come in. Uh, maybe in an atmosphere where it's not quite as loud or maybe not quite as chaotic with all the kids, but, but get them here to see the life that exists in these children and the stories that we're going to share with you here in a moment. I want them to be a part of that as well because as you and I know, uh, a lot of times when you hang out with kids, when you're not the one in charge and you hang out with kids, it brings some life to you too, doesn't it? It brings some joy that you just don't get hanging out with adults in everyday life. And so it's truly, truly rewarding. We wanted to share a few things with you. Um, VBS Pass, how many of you went to VBS at some point in your life? As a kid, um, at some point, almost every single hand is raised. How strange is that? Not very strange at all. But you do realize we're in a generation now where if we ask this in 20 years, probably half of the hands or more would not be raised because people aren't going as often as what they used to. I know I always did. I know I can remember my mom's blue Reliant K station wagon. Some of you remember those. Nice, fine Chrysler product that it was. Um, and uh, there was no benches in the trunk of said station wagon, just windows, but that didn't matter. We would have 10, 11, 12 people in that station wagon going to VBS because it was all about how many kids could we possibly bring to VBS and get to hang out with. And I, I had some neighbors and some other friends we'd pick up on the way. There were no laws regarding such things. Kids, you could sit in the trunk. Yes, you could sit in the, you're like, trunk? Well, there were windows in these trunks. It was called a station wagon. You don't have those anymore. Um, <laughs> maybe parents want to put their kids in the trunk. Don't do it, okay? <laughs> That's not a good thing. To, we're not recommending that at all. Um, I can remember VBS as a kid. I can remember my mom was often director of said VBS with another lady, local lady. Um, she just recently moved, named Karina Stewart. Some of you might have known her from over at First Christian. A wonderful lady, one of my mom's best friends in the world. Um, and she, my mom loved VBS so much that she dressed up like a clown, makeup and all, for VBS. And if you know my mom at all, that is not normal for her. Um, nor have I ever seen her in a clown costume since. But still, something about VBS just brings it out. I walked out of my front door or my garage door on Wednesday morning, I believe it was, and a lady was walking her dog in the neighborhood. It was one of the ladies I hadn't met yet, so I walked out and just introduced myself, talked to her for a moment. We ended up talking about VBS. And even as an older lady, she remembered going to VBS, and she went to a free Methodist church as a kid, and she, she remembered the name. I can't remember what she said. All I remember was a sister so-and-so. I remember sister so-and-so, and I remember this lesson that she taught me as a child in VBS, and I went, yeah, that's why we do it. <laughs> it's exactly why we're continuing to do it. It was an incredible, incredible thing. And so let's share some stories from the week. Uh, one of the first ones that was shared with me was Cheryl Williams. She shared with me a story about a young man, her and, and this young man were having a little debate as to which is better, VBS or pizza. I'll have you know that VBS won. Yeah, really. He came to that conclusion all by himself. My daughter, Kinley, loves VBS. She cried the last night, as she always does at the end of VBS, because it's over. And so we were looking, and actually in Cloverdale, where our house is, there's a big church right when you get off the internet, interstate, just south of the interstate, and their VBS is next week. So we may just take her over to that just for fun, let her go to VBS again, because she would absolutely love it. Each day, we, we gave the kids a little extra challenge. Um, my wife started this a few years ago at our church, and so we just continued on that tradition. And we, we found an object, and this year it was a little rubber duck. And each night, we hid this somewhere on the property um, where the kids would be. And so the goal was for someone to find this duck, return it to me at the end of the night, and they would get a fabulous treasure. The great treasure hunt fits quite well. And so uh, we did that. And so on night one, a little girl brought it up. Um, real cute little girl, and their, their whole team had kind of founded their second grade team, and so we're like, great, we gave them, gave them the prize, but then after VBS, we found out, in fact, 
that a young man, a third grade boy, actually found that duck. And then he gave it to the young lady. And we're like, Phew. That's not normal. Um, what, what's going on? And so that whole group got their big ice cream celebration, but we found that out. So on the next night, Tuesday night, we brought that young man named Braylon up front, and we said, hey, well done. You know, and everybody was just, they were super excited to hear that story. That was a really cool thing. And wouldn't you know, this was not planned in any way, shape, or form, wouldn't you know who found that little rubber duck on Tuesday night? But Braylon. Hmm. Hey, God taught all of us a lesson that night. When we do what God wants us to do, what we know is right, then he rewards us. In that way, it just seems trivial and insignificant, but how huge was that to him? That he did the right thing in this moment. He didn't have to do that at all. It was his duck. He could have done it, but he just willingly gave it, didn't make a big deal of it, no scene. And here's God the next day said, hey, nice job. Well done. Here's some ice cream for you too. What a cool little story to share with everybody. God taught us all. I got to meet with the junior hires throughout the week. Um, over 25 different junior hires throughout the week came and went. Um, it was an incredible week. We had the biggest group on the last night of 20. It was a wonderful night. But I met a young man, an eighth grade young man, who uh, I just sat down to have dinner with and began having conversation with and just started asking about families. And, you know, that's risky territory to get to do that. But I did. And he was just really open and honest. And he said, as an eighth grade boy, you know what? Uh, I live with my mom. My dad told me a few years ago he didn't want anything to do with me. Just completely rejected me. Doesn't, doesn't care for me. Doesn't want me to be a son. Nothing else. And I just looked at him. I said, man, I'm sorry. I can't imagine that myself, and I'm sure that most of you can't either, but I know there's some who have experienced that kind of rejection in your life somewhere. And this is an eighth grade young man who now doesn't have a man to look up to in his life because of his father's ignorance, quite honestly. We don't know what caused that. We don't know what his father is going through, but it's unimaginable to me personally. But what's really interesting is I got to share with him the reminder that his heavenly father loves him. And I got to share with him that, hey, man, I'd love to get connected somehow, some way. We'd love to support you on your journey into manhood. And here we are hosting this VBS, and this young man shows up. And who brings several little kids with him the next day on the bus from his apartment complex but this young man? <laughs> who was only here because one of our volunteers sought fit to go get a bus to borrow for us to go pick up these kids from this apartment complex. Yeah, that's what can happen at VBS. On the final night, we tried something brand new. We, we didn't do the traditional pool party the day afterwards. No, we, we decided to do something big on the last night. And so we invited all the kids, all the families, all the workers to stay after VBS for a cookout. We rented some inflatables, um, and they were an incredible, incredible hit. At 9.30 at night, there were still kids on the inflatables, and for those of you that know them, the Burns family was still outside playing knockout on the new basketball goal <laughs> that we got put in that night. I might have missed some people, but I tried really close to pay attention as everybody was dismissed from the closing program, if you will. I didn't see a single person leave. I didn't see anyone go get in their car and go home. Everybody stayed. Everybody stayed for the food, for the fellowship. We got to meet some new families, some new people from the community. We wanted to share with them just how much we truly care. And some might say we even got to witness a miracle that you might not be aware of. Our food all week was incredible. You'll get that message here in a minute when you see the kids video. But uh, Aaron and his team do an incredible, incredible job. Our church provides a full dinner for all of the kids and volunteers every single night of VBS. That's not normal for VBS. And it's an incredible, incredible blessing to those that come um, we are grateful for it. I, my family loved it. It was just a neat twist. But anyway, he shared with me that uh, before uh, the, the, the event, he saw all the people in here and said, I don't think we're going to have enough food. There's no way we're going to have enough food. But then he shared with me afterwards, it, it must have been some little boy's lunch thing because we had leftovers in the end. Ah, yes, the book of John revisited. Well done. Well done. In our lesson time, many of the activities that we shared with the kids involved a competition to collect candy or collect other things like that. But what we found was, as that competition was ending and everybody was coming back together, it seemed that those that had a bunch and those that had very little or none uh, often shared with them, thus completely ruining the point of the lesson, but, but a great sign for those kids and their hearts, at least at this phase of life. And we just had to tweak the lesson just a little to make it understandable for them. 
Church, we have to let that be our example. There is still hope. Don't quit. People are worth it. Even if you've become frustrated with culture, with the news, with what you perceive as the hopeless condition of humanity, maybe even frustrated with the church, that can happen. Then today, take today as a moment to set aside and get refocused that we can't put our hope in any of those things. Our hope is only in Jesus Christ, and he's still at work in this world and through people, and he wants you, he wants to use you and the hope that you have found to reach the lost world. This week is a great reminder of the call on each and every one of our lives, and it should hopefully renew the desire for us to reach as many people as we possibly can in our limited time on this planet. So we thought we'd share with you the teachings from the week, because the adults aren't all in the classes. Many of you weren't here. You might have had kids drop them off, but you weren't in the classes with them. So we wanted to share you some of the teachings that we shared um, from the VBS curriculum this week. Monday's lesson was based on Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you pursuing? Gold or glory in heaven? Now, I was working with the junior hires, and so we read that in the place where it is in the book of Matthew. And I said, all right, guys. I said, we talked a little about what they thought it meant, and they, they kind of understood a little bit. I said, well, here's the thing. I said, you must understand that the way we read the Bible right now is not exactly how it was presented back when it was recorded. I said, the chapters, these big numbers that are in there, those weren't even added till 1,200 years after the time of Christ. And the little numbers, all the verses, the ones that are actually in our Bibles right now, weren't added till the 1500s. Much, 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 much later. And so what we do then is we take these verses out of context and we don't relate it to the whole story, the whole thing that Jesus maybe was sharing. So let's do that. Let's look at that real quick. And so what you learn very quickly is that this passage was taken out of the middle of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. The incredible, incredible message of Jesus, the longest recorded sermon, the longest recorded teaching of Jesus, which included such incredible things as the Beatitudes and many, many, many more teachings of Jesus. But we just take this little passage out. I said, so let's, let's look around it and see why did Jesus say this? How did he arrive at this conclusion? What does it mean? How do you store up treasures in heaven? We don't have to look very far back into chapter 5, starting in verse 38 where Jesus is talking about, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yes, revenge. Still a very popular thing in our culture. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you in the right cheek, turn the other cheek as well. And if he wants to sue you to take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Because when you do these things, you store up treasure in heaven. Verse 43, love your enemies. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Because when you do, you store up treasure in heaven. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And if you do, you will have no reward from the heavenly Father. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give or may be giving in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you with treasure in heaven. He talks about prayer. This is the passage in chapter 5, or the beginning of chapter 6, where Jesus introduces the Lord's Prayer, as it's called. And he's telling them, this is how you pray. This is how you begin to store treasure. In heaven, he goes into fasting after that and re developing that relationship with Christ where we can set aside something earthly, something needed earthly, and allow our, that time to focus on him. And in doing so, we continue to build up this mass of riches in heaven. And then he follows the passage after he goes through all of this and says, hey, don't store up your treasures here. They're going to go away. Store them up there. He goes on and says, no one can serve two masters. Either we will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one 
and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And with the junior hires, we took it this direction. We asked for examples. We started thinking about people they've seen pursuing treasures. And it got really real in a, in a moment because after working with middle school and high school students for 20-some years, I could tell them personal examples of students who I saw as middle school, high school, were on fire for Christ, but then they had to get a job to earn money for things they didn't need. Not a job because they had to support their family. That's a totally different circumstance, and those kids need to be appreciated and honored, and we need to go to those kids and meet them in those places to minister to them. But those kids just pursuing things of this world, and before you know it, there went church, there went youth group, there went mission trip, Totally done because they were pursuing the stuff. And then we get made real personal with adults and said, all right, what do adults do? Well, they pursue their work instead of their family. They're too busy with this. They're too busy with that, trying to earn money, trying to accumulate wealth, trying to do this, pay off debt that they have, that they lose focus of what's important. They can't serve two masters. And then Jesus finishes chapter six by saying, and when you try to serve two masters, when you, when you allow money to be your God, then what you'll find is your life is full of worry. You'll be worried about everything, what you eat, what you drink, where you live, you name it, you'll be worried about it. And he challenges us to say, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to live. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't I take care of everything else? Look at all of the birds of the field. Look at the flowers. Look, at, they all, they get along just fine. They don't have care in the world. Neither should you if you trust in me. And this is the kind of thing we get the opportunity to share with these students at VBS. Now, is this countercultural? This is a little different than the message, say, they get in everyday life on TV and media, movies, even at school. I hope you think so. Day two led us to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, the second passage that that day's lesson talked about was from the book of John, chapter 10, verse 27. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I know we all ask the students a simple question, so money's evil, right? We'll get back to that here in just a minute. The students had a task to perform in the lesson. Both the middle school, elementary, everybody did this task. We gave them two things. I had an assistant sitting beside me, as did my wife when she was teaching the younger students. And I had an assistant had five $1 bills, and they just kind of played with them, fanned them out, messed with them. This was the prize money, the $5 of prize money. And we said the word prize money as often as we possibly could when describing the prize money. And then we had a big stack of like monopoly money, fake money. Okay, and we took that fake money, and we called it fake money as often as we could, and we took that fake money and threw it all over the room, spread out all over the room, and we said, on the count of three, I want everybody to go, and when we say go, we want you to collect as much prize money as you possibly can. The person with the most prize money at the end of this wins. So we said go, and they ran out, and they picked up all the fake money they possibly could, had big giant stacks of fake money when they sat back down. And we went over this with them. We said, now, who has the most prize money? Oh, I've got thousands of fake dollars. That's great. Not a single kid ever picked up the prize money, the five real dollar bills. We gave them the instructions. They were as clear as they possibly could be, but they were deceived by the fake all around them. Welcome to the world. We're all deceived by that fake thing that we all pursue, that all the world is after, and we miss the true prize. We don't listen to the voice of the Father in heaven telling us what's important, what we need for our life. In reality, the students could have had five real dollar bills, like real money they could take and use to purchase things. In reality, they were left with absolutely worthless paper that meant nothing at all. Do you know not a single student at any age level picked up on that immediately? But the moment we described what was going on to them at the end, they all dead silent. Oh. Oh. I pray that we don't have that same problem in our life. The lesson in listening to the voice of God. The world is chasing after everything that is fake. It's not genuine. It's not real. It won't last. But God has a greater plan. This plan for us to serve him in this lifetime and store up these treasures for heaven as we talked about the day before and part of that learning is being able to listen for God's voice his presence in our life and it can be hard we can be distracted by the fake things laying all over the floor that we want a bunch of because we think that's what's important the last thing we reminded them of was in fact money money's not evil money's neutral 
Money has no power whatsoever at all on its own. Can it be used for evil? Absolutely. Can it be used for good? Absolutely. Here's the reality. It's the heart of the one who's using it that determines its worth. Day three, Acts 30 or 20, verse 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, this is the words of Paul in the book of Acts. And Paul says, when he says this, that he is quoting Jesus. Now, you can look back through the Gospels, but you'll never, ever find the passage where Jesus says it is better or blessed, it is more blessed to, be, to give than to receive. He never officially is quoted as saying that. Now, we have the author John who tells us that Jesus said and did so many other things that if they were all recorded, there'd be not enough books in the whole world to contain everything. So it's very, very likely that Jesus did say something very similar to this. We just don't have the record of it. What we do have is an illustration in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38, where Jesus does say, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I asked the middle schoolers a simple question. Why is it so hard to give? Now, the junior hires were very boldly honest. They said, and I quote, because we're all selfish. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much sums it up. That's really the only reason why folks don't give. How right they are at any age, whether it's a very young child who doesn't want to give up a toy or a piece of candy to an older adult who doesn't want to part with something. But here's the problem. When we, we talk about giving, especially in the church, but when we talk about giving, the first thing that pops into every single person's brain is money. Now, let me start there. Money is an appropriate thing to give. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, it's a necessary thing to give. The local church right here, missionary organizations, many parachurch organizations throughout the entire world exist simply on the donations that are given to them and the general, generous support of those involved. It takes money to host a VBS. <laughs> it takes money to support the local missionaries that we support and the ones in Haiti that we support in other parts of the world. It takes money to support the staff and the ministry leaders here at this very church. But the reality is money is necessary, but it's only the beginning of what it means to give. There's simply so many, many ways in which a person can give of their time of their skills, of their passions, even just of their willingness to be a part of things in the church, of their encouraging words, of their support for those that can do some specific skills. Our time is the one I'll focus on. Now, I know we live in a world where many things seem to steal or take our time from us. They steal it away. Then before we know it, it's gone, and we don't even know what happen to it. These might be things that we volunteer for, we sign up for, we commit to, that don't seem to bring about the reward that God promised in the book of Luke chapter 6. And so here's a couple of potential reasons for why maybe that there's a disconnect there. The first is this, maybe it's possible that it's not God's will that you give yourself to that particular thing, whatever that thing might be whether it's your time, your finances, your skills, or other resources, it is possible that God might not be in that organization or in that event at all. As important as it might seem, maybe God would rather you use and invest your time and energy and resources elsewhere. Now, I know I personally have had that happen. You get involved with something, you think it's a good thing, you think all's going well, and then you just realize it's just a drain on your life. Like nothing is positive is happening. There is no benefit I don't mean financial benefit, but I mean, there just doesn't seem to be a reason why you're continuing on with this. All it does is take. And while it might be hard, because none of us like to let folks down or step away from commitments, it might be wise to consider investing yourself elsewhere. But the second thought is kind of in opposition to that, because it's all on you and me. Now, some people might have heard that first thought and said, well, gosh, the pastor just said that I don't need to volunteer in the church anymore because it seems like sometimes this is how I feel. Well, here's the thing. That's not the way God works. You see, serving Christ is a whole different arena. Our joy, our fulfillment, our pleasure in serving him is 100% absolutely completely connected to the heart in which you and I serve with. I've been on enough trips, service trips, and mission trips to know if I go in thinking this is terrible work, what I'm about to do, then guess what? It's terrible work, what I'm about to do. 
But if I go into thinking, hey, I don't care what it is I'm doing, if this somehow helps someone, even if it seems like completely insignificant to me, then I walk away from that day, no matter the heat, the humidity, the sun, the circumstances we're in, we walk away with that day refreshed, re-energized, and rewarded for what we did that day. And it all had to do with my heart and the way I entered into that work. If we volunteer to serve while complaining and whining, and don't say you haven't done it because we all, every one of us, have done it, then what we're striving to do is make ourselves miserable while we're serving. But there's a funny thing, and some of you have had this experience. God sometimes comes along and smacks you in the face and says, what are you thinking? You ended up having a conversation with a child or with an adult. You asked a question and got an answer. You saw that that teaching finally clicked with that one student. It might have been the simplest breakthrough on planet earth, but it was unexpected. And you realized all of a sudden, even with your terrible attitude, God said, no, look what I can do even when you act like this. Why don't you try to do something a little bit differently? So the question becomes, why do we start there? Why do we start from a negative place when we're serving Christ? Why would we ever consider that? If you looked at every opportunity God presents you to serve, as an opportunity too. Now, I did not say we have to do every opportunity that's presented to us. That's not it at all, because there are a lot of opportunities that exist. We can't say yes to all of them. But if we looked at every opportunity we have to serve in two ways, first of all, as a way to offer thanks back to our Lord and Savior for what he did for us. If you approach every opportunity to serve as a thank you gift back to Jesus, could you possibly serve too much? Could you possibly have a bad attitude being thankful to Jesus? I pray the answer would be no. The second thing, if you, had every, if you looked at every opportunity to serve as an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with someone that may not know, is there any way to spin that in a negative direction? Well, there's one. If you go back to the reasons the junior hires gave for not giving in the first place, it's because of our own selfish interests and desires. See, the reality is, and many of you, most of you know this deep inside, giving brings joy. There's just no two ways about it. When you have something to offer, whether it's finances or skills or abilities or encouragement, when you give something to offer to someone else in need and you choose to give it with the right spirit, you are always rewarded. And the really funny thing is, you're not even just rewarded with other things. You are rewarded internally. Your physical body responds to the act of giving, doesn't it? Like it brings you joy inside. It makes you happy. It makes you feel good to give and to serve. Do you think that's a coincidence by any chance? That God tells us, this is who I need you to be. That our wires, our bodies are hardwired. That when we respond accordingly to God's desire for us, we physically feel that. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. The chemicals released that caused that to happen were put there by God on purpose for a purpose. God has given us eyes, hearts, minds, ears to see, feel, understand, and hear the need of those people around us. Are we tuning in to those needs? Or do we force our God-given senses to shut down so that we can just ignore everything else that's going on all around us and just focus on ourselves? a hard question to ask, but it's a very true reality. The fourth day, Proverbs 22, 1, the last day, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. As it turns out, that's actually the exact direction we're headed into after Father's Day. What does it mean to have a good name? What's a good name worth these days? What happens when you're simply nice to people around you? Let's stay tuned after Father's Day. That's where we're jumping back in. So on that last night, we asked kids, what does it mean to have a good name? Because that's kind of an old-fashioned kind of terminology. Would they even understand what that means? And as it turns out, absolutely, they, they understood completely. They associated with the word reputation. Fairly accurate comparison, not the word they would have used in the old days, but absolutely correct. My group, we went through some different professions. We started with a doctor, a teacher, a mechanic. What does it mean for someone in those professions to have a good name, to have a good reputation? What kind of work are they doing? What kind of service are they going to provide if that's the case? And I realized in talking with them that even in today's culture, having a good name is still important. Even though the world 
is may try to destroy you for having a good name, especially if your good name belongs to Jesus. But that's for the next series. When we're a Christian, this is what was told to the students of the younger levels. When we are a Christian, when we wear the name of Christ, when others see us, we want them to see the good name of Christ. If we store up treasures in heaven, we are sharing that good name of Jesus. If we store up treasures on earth, the only thing we're sharing is ourselves. It's an interesting thing to think about. So if you have a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a neighbor, someone you know was here at VBS or honestly goes to VBS anywhere else, follow up with them. Talk to them about what they've learned. Have a conversation with them. The seed has been planted. But Paul's the one that alludes to this idea that once the seed is planted, somebody's got to come along and water it. Somebody's got to come along and fertilize it. None of us can make it grow. Only the Spirit can do that within them. But what we can do is just continue to help the process. We can offer a ride for those kids and those families to come to VBS. We can offer to volunteer in their classes. We can offer whatever it takes to continue reaching out with the love of Jesus to that child and to that family. And every moment of it, moment of it is, is worth it. To close with, as a part of the storyline throughout the week, the students were introduced to a couple of characters on stage via some skits each night. The, the two main characters were Pirate Pete and Truly Belle, and then there was a couple of secondary characters that made a, a guest appearance one night, Megan one night, and, and Destiny the other. And Pirate Pete, of course, was on a real treasure hunt. He was after silver and gold and the riches and things of this world. He, he kept finding other people to do his dirty work for him and go find the other clue, but those other people kept mating with travesty on those uh, journeys, shall we say, and very turned off and didn't really like Captain Pete, um, Pirate Pete, after those moments at all. Throughout the week, though, uh, Truly Bell was constantly trying to tell Pirate Pete what this treasure hunt was really all about, that it wasn't about earthly treasures, but that it was about this greater treasure, this treasure that would never be stolen, could never be taken away from him, this treasure that could be stored up for him in heaven. And the hunt was, was, this reality of this hunt was that the first will actually end up being last, and, and the last will end up being the first in this treasure hunt. Well, it took Pirate Pete a while, but the students that portrayed this did such an excellent job. We wanted to share with you the last scene from their skits this week. 